If you'd like to stand with us, we'll read. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Now, if you've been following with us on our Wednesday night teaching, we've been going through the doctrine of salvation. And so the messages that I've preached this morning, these are going to be illustrations, if you will, or pictures that will help uh, illustrate the doctrine of the grace of God. Ephesians chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 1. <clears throat> And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others." But God, who is rich in His mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Father, we thank you so much for being able to assemble. It's a blessing to see my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, it's just good to be in church. And God, I pray that you might encourage us today, that just being able to come and do what little bit we do today might be a shot in the arm to encourage us throughout the week. And I pray, God, this book would come alive and... You might use the Word of God to help us, to encourage us. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we thank you that you've been so merciful to us. And Lord, I pray that uh, as we look in the Word of God, you might give us something. You might feed us with your Word. Help us. Encourage us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> like I said, uh, these two messages that we're looking at is really going to be pictures of God's grace because we've given some doctrine about salvation. We've studied with our lessons on Wednesday nights about how salvation is something God does for a sinner. He's the Savior, we're the sinners. So salvation is something God does for a sinner who can't justify himself. Religion is what people try to do to justify themselves. Salvation is what God does for sinners who can't help themselves, for sinners who can't save themselves. And we talked about God's grace. God's grace. And God is the one who exhibits this grace in our life. God's grace, you can take it down as an acronym, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. So God's able to give us salvation because of Jesus Christ. And so when you begin to break this thing down and you see it here in the text, we're saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. We didn't save ourselves. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So we've given you some doctrine. Now we're going to give you some demonstration. Now we're going to look at some examples, some pictures of grace. Now here in the text we see another word. We see mercy. Mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. I don't know if you realize it, but all of us here deserve hell. You deserve, we're all going to get death and we deserve hell. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell. The Bible says all liars shall have their part. You ever told a lie? That fish was this big, you know. We all deserve hell. God's mercy is Him not giving us hell, but God's grace is Him opening up the doors of heaven. So you have two aspects of that. God's mercy is not giving us what we deserve. God's grace is giving us what we do not deserve. He gives us heaven. So God's grace is amazing. We sing the song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I 
C. I believe that song will be sung in heaven. I think we'll all gather around. We'll have Newton come and he'll lead that song and we'll sing that thing around the throne. I believe. I don't know for sure, but uh, I think it'd be pretty cool if we could. Now, God's unmerited favor and help is His grace. You say, what is grace? Think about the word. To be gracious. To be grateful. Are you grateful that we have a church to come to? Yeah. I think one thing we're going to get out of this, we're going to be very grateful that we have some freedoms. And I know there's extremes on both sides of this issue and we're having our freedoms tested and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to get into that this morning. However, I think we all can appreciate the fact that we're able to assemble. That's right. Amen. You don't know what you have oftentimes until it's taken away. That word congratulated, that word grace is in there. Gracious. You leave a gratuity when, you, when your server pleases you and does a good job, right? In England, they address royalty as your grace. The parliament declares an act of grace when they pardon a criminal. An act of grace. Gracing. That's a few extra issues of a magazine when you don't want to pay it. You didn't want it in the first place, but somehow they got your account number and now they're charging you for this magazine. Well, they give you a grace period where they give you a few extra issues of it. Sometimes the preacher gives you a few extra minutes after 12 o'clock. <laughs> like last week. Some of you, you watched it and you're like, before you watch it, am I going to watch that thing? It's an hour and 45 minutes, whatever it was last week. We're not going to be that long this week, I promise you. <laughs> So we talk about grace or gracing in that period that has to do with giving a little extra. Grace period, you have that with mortgages and things like that. Somebody said God's grace is his super glue. I think that's pretty good. Now, I want us to look first of all at Mark chapter number 10, if you will. We're going to look at a few pictures of grace here to help illustrate God's grace. And if you're saved, you're saved by grace. If you're in here this morning, you're in here because of the grace of God. And I think sometimes we, we kind of get a little bit proud. Maybe we get proud as peacocks and we wander around and we think everything is good. Uh, but that's not necessarily how, how it is. You know, we think that we have it all under control and we think that we're our own person. And, you know, we use that term that, uh, well, I can handle this. I've got this. And sometimes we rely on our own strength and many times I think that, that deceives us. In other words, we're able to do certain things and then we think we can handle other things. Do you realize you don't even think and have the right processes go through your mind unless it's the grace of God allowing that? God has given you your body. He's given you your health. He's given you your mind. He's given you your heart. And so we, we walk like the song says, I can't even walk without Him holding my hand. And when you think about salvation, you're saved by God's grace. You couldn't save yourself. If it was left up, left up to you and me, we would scramble around trying to justify ourselves, trying to quit our sinning, trying to come up with a way to get to heaven, and we'd never make it. You can't earn your way to heaven. And so... I want us to reflect on some great pictures of grace here because what grace does, when we really think about it, it magnifies the Lord. It takes the image off of the sinner and puts it on the Savior. It takes the image off of the person and puts it on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's really what it's all about. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that. Let's look over here in Mark chapter number 10 and we'll notice God's grace and with each one of these characters, I have kind of a name for him. Of course, we can call him the blind beggar. The blind beggar or the poor pauper, I don't know. But look in verse number 46. Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith, 
hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Here's the blind beggar. Blind Bartimaeus. I quoted the song Amazing Grace just a minute ago. And that song actually comes from John chapter 9, another blind man that got healed. And he makes the statement, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, talking about Christ because they're questioning him. He goes, one thing I know is whereas I was blind, but now I see. That's where that song comes from. One thing I know is I was on my way to hell. I knew that I was condemned. I knew I couldn't save myself. And then when I heard about Jesus, I put my faith in Jesus and He saved me. You say, preacher, I don't think I can talk to people about my faith because I don't know the Bible good enough and I haven't memorized enough verses and I had not been to school. All you need to know is that you were lost and now you're found. All you need to know is you were on your way to hell, now you're on your way to heaven. All you need to know is that Jesus saved you and He can save anybody. And you simply tell them, look, I'm not trying to get in your business, but I'm telling you this, you need Jesus Christ to save you. Because we're all in trouble. I was on my way to hell and He saved me. I had a big empty spot in my heart. And that's what this world's chasing after. They're trying to fill it with their careers. They're trying to fill it with relationships. They're trying to fill it with money, with pleasure, with all these kind of things. There's a God spot inside of there that says this is where I belong. And until you find Him, you're empty. The blind beggar, he's sitting out there. Notice his city. The Bible says it's Jericho. Now Jericho is about six miles from the Jordan River, 18 miles from Jerusalem. It's the gateway of Judea from the east, and oftentimes it had a lot of uh, wealthy people or people that would trade and market. You remember the story about the Samaritan that comes down, and there's a, a road going down to Jericho where the guy got mugged, and the guy helped him because he might have had money coming back and forth and, and going, and we're going to see another character in a minute there in Jericho that does have some money. But Jericho, when you begin to look at this city, you find this guy is there, and he's outside of there begging for money because he doesn't have any money. I mean, he's blind. He's not living in America where... Thank the Lord we are blessed in this country. If you have a disability, you can get some disability help. It might not be a full paycheck. I know that. I know some people are on disability and they're barely rubbing two pennies together. But thank God at least they're able to eat. What's one of the biggest health problems with poor people in America? You know what the biggest health problems with poor people in America is? Obesity. You would think the biggest health problem with poor people would be they're skinny and they're starving to death. Starving to death is not a problem in America. Not yet, anyway. They got you all worried you're going to run out of meat. Where's the beef? <laughs> Give me some beef, you know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about all that. <laughs> we won't get into that. Thank God for truck drivers. Amen. What you deliver or what you drive. But uh, I'm glad the truck drivers are still taking the food to the stores. Amen. You talk about all the nurses, and thank God for nurses and doctors and CNAs and RNAs and, and whatever, DNA, whatever. <laughs> thank God for that too, but thank God for truck drivers. Amen. I'm glad when I go to the store, there's sometimes some toilet paper on the shelf. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but uh, in this day, you didn't have the abundance and the affluence and prosperity that we have. And like I said, the cupboard could run dry. I don't know how this thing's going to go. But he had to beg. And I've been in the Philippines years ago, and I was there, and I saw some beggars. I saw a guy begging, and his eyes were, you could tell the guy was blind. He wasn't a charlatan. Like some people over here, you know, they're, they got the wheelchair there, and then, uh, then you're out there begging, they got a big wad of money. Then at the end of the day, they get up and they push their wheelchair back home. <laughs> they're, not, they're not having to use the wheelchair. You know what I mean? But over there I saw a guy and he, he's sitting on the side of the road in rags begging for whatever he can get in his eyes. Man, they're all messed up. You can tell the guy's blind. So what would you do? I emptied my pockets. That's what I did. But this guy is having to beg. He's at this point where he has a sickness. He has a blindness that leads to his begging. He's having to rely on people. He sees his own condition. He can't see the world around him, but he can see the trouble inside of him. And that's what the, the uh, problem that a sinner has to come to. They have to get to the place where they can see their own sin problem, their own sickness problem. This guy knew he had a problem. I mean, he's out there begging. He has to have somebody lead him to the water. Or lead him to whatever he needs for help. 
At least he's got that. You know, one good thing about going to the jails, and we, of course, haven't been able to go, and the guys haven't been able to go because of all the things going on. But one thing about that, when you get to preaching to those guys, you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to convince them that they're a sinner because they know they ain't got in trouble. Of course, I know all of them are innocent. <laughs> you know, they all, somebody framed them and every one of them's innocent. I get all that, you know. But sometimes I'm just real frank with them. I say, look, you know. You're in trouble. You, you did wrong. That's why you're here. And we, ain't, we ain't buying this kind of stuff. And we believe that. And you can get that across to some of those guys. But people that live a quote-unquote normal or moral life, sometimes it's hard for them to see their sickness. You know, when you got saved, something happened to you where you fell under conviction and you understood that you needed to be saved. He could see his sickness. There's a story of a guy, and he is in a, uh, he's in a kind of a forsaken town, forsaken area, and he's in this old shack, and he's just trying to come in from the outside, and it's real dark in there, and he's trying to scrounge around, see if he can find any kind of food. He can't see. It's all stormy outside, and inside it's this black pitch, and so he reaches around, he gets him a candle, and he sees some old dates. So he starts eating those dates. I don't, I don't do much on dates. Anyway, he's eating these things, and he notices as he's looking at them, there's a worm in one of them. So he throws that away, grabs another one, eats it. Another worm. So then he blows the candle out and eats the rest of them. <laughs> but you know, that's how a lot of people are. A lot of people, they just want to close their eyes and not see the sin or see the sickness. This guy couldn't see the world around him, but he could see the problem inside of him. And he cries out. He's begging. He has to. His situation is pretty desperate because what's taking place here in Mark chapter 10, if you know your, your Bible here, you know that Jesus Christ is passing through here for the very last time. I mean, he's headed to Jerusalem and he's headed for the cross. And this beggar has probably heard a lot of things about Jesus and how he's healed people, especially of blindness. He healed a lot of people of blindness. I don't know any of you that wear contacts and glasses. I do. My wife does. We have very, very poor vision. Thank God for glasses and contact lens. Amen. It's a blessing. Can you imagine not having any of that? So Jesus Christ healed a lot of blind people back in that day. He hears Jesus coming. And the situation is pretty pressing at this point. It's now or never. And he cries out. You see him crying out here, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he's not worried if somebody hears him. He's not worried if uh, people are going to make fun of him. He's just crying out because he is desperate. It's not about what everybody thinks. It's about what Jesus Christ can do for him. The old time days, they did altar calls. We do them here. And it's a very, very rare thing in modern day for people to have the gall, the, the, the gall and the courage and the boldness to get up in front of people during an invitation and walk down to trust Christ as their personal Savior. You say, what happens when people do that? They say, I don't care what everybody thinks. Matter of fact, I want them to know that I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. You see his situation, you see his salvation. Verse number 49, Jesus stood still. He stops. He commands him to be called. Notice what happens in verse 50. The guy gets up. He cast away his garment. That was probably like a mantle, something he slept in, kind of like his tent. His, in order for him to get as quick as he can to Jesus, he lets go of it. That's a great type of repentance. It's a great type of turning from and turning toward. You hear the voice of Jesus, you go to that voice. Thank God for His grace, but you've got to respond to His grace. He can call all day long, and He can say, Whosoever will, let Him come, but you have to respond to it. And He responded when He heard Jesus say, Come on, and I'll help you. And so He goes to Jesus Christ, the blind beggar. You'll notice there's a casting away, there's a confession in verse number 51. It's amazing to me. Obviously, everybody knows he's blind Bartimaeus. Everybody knows about it, but Jesus says, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I mean, the guy's blind, and Jesus says, what wilt thou have me to do? He wants the man to tell him. It's kind of like when Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord, and the Lord says, what is your name? He's like, you don't know my name? <laughs> He wants him to say, I am Jacob. There's something about a confession. 
That's why the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We try to encourage people when they trust Jesus Christ as Savior to pray or to call on him. You don't have to do that. If you believe on Jesus Christ, Trust Him as your personal Savior. The moment you put faith in Him, He saves you. So I believe somebody hears the gospel. You talk about Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He buried. He rose again. He'll save you if you'll put your faith. You give an altar call. Before they even walk down the aisle, if they have trusted Him in their heart, they're saved just like that. But calling on Him, confessing Him as, Christ, as Lord, that does something for you. It helps you with assurance of salvation. And he says, what do you want me to do? He says, I want to be made whole. And he says, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Immediately he received his sight. In Luke chapter 18, you don't have to turn, but in that account it says, immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people when they saw it gave praise unto God. The blind beggar. Where would you be without the grace of God? You would be blind. Maybe during this current crisis you will be so concerned and worried and upside, you know, the world's turned upside down and you don't know whether to breathe the air when you step out on your porch. You don't know if the clouds have corona clouds. What do corona clouds look like? I don't, I don't know. Maybe they're going to drop corona droplets on my head. And I mean, you, you, the, the fear and the panic and, and everything just goes crazy. Maybe you get involved in some kind of religious system because you think if you do these religious rituals, they're going to save you and you're going to do these things. Maybe it's good works, good deeds. Maybe you just buy into the idea there's no God at all. So in order to just go on through your life, you just think, well, we're just an animal. We're just like animals. We're, there's no God. We just evolved and you just buy that line and you go through. The point is, if you did all that, you're just blind. You're just going through life blind without any assurance about what's going to happen after you die. That's a terrible way to live. And there are millions of people doing just that. Blind. Aren't you glad the blinders have been taken off? Aren't you glad you know the truth? I was telling the folks earlier this morning that passage over in John where Jesus says, If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus Christ told you He's preparing a place for you. He told you you're going to heaven. He said, If it were not so, I would have told you. We don't have to wander around and grope around in the dark and try to find our way or beg. We have been given the truth. The blinders have come off. God's amazing grace has saved us. I'm not going to hell anymore. I'm going to heaven. My sins have been erased. My sins have been taken away. I've been forgiven by His grace. I'm not a beggar anymore. I don't have to depend on this world to take care of me. Blind Bartimaeus. Blind beggar. Take a right turn and come to Luke chapter 19. Two more, Luke chapter 19. Uh, the problem I have with a lot of preachers is not what they say necessarily, but what they won't say. Sometimes you have preachers, and what they'll do is they'll talk about God's grace and they'll talk about God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And they talk about the love of God, but why do we need the love of God? Why do we need the grace of God? We need the grace of God because there's something wrong with us. We need the grace of God because we're sinners. And the reason we talk so much about heaven is because we're not going to hell. There is a literal burning hell beneath our feet. And God has saved us from that place. I really believe Revelation chapter 20, when we see that lake of fire, and we see people cast into that place, we are going to just realize to the great extent, the grace of God saving us from that place. I mean, I think we don't, we don't grasp it right now. We just say, well, God's a God of love, and God saved me, and He died for my sins, and that's good, and I've been forgiven. Do you realize where you would be? You would be on fire, never be able to be put out. You would be burning forever and ever and ever. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, Revelation 14. We have been saved. You say, saved from what? Saved from hell. Amen. I've been saved from the penalty of my sin. I've been saved from the punishment of my sin. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. Talk about grace. Look over here in Luke chapter 19. Let's look at the second one here. Luke chapter number 19, a picture of grace. We had a blind beggar. 
And now Luke chapter 19, you know the story. Kids like this one. Luke chapter 19, this is the story of Zacchaeus. Verse number 1, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press, because he was of little, little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So here's Zacchaeus. They say if you go to Jerusalem today and you find that tree, there ain't no bark on the tree. Where he, where he, 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 he climbed down and he just came, came down so quick he just ripped all the bark off. Lily says, really? There ain't no bark on that tree. Um, now notice here in the text that this is a little short guy, so we can call him the short swindler. Or we can call him the petite publican, whatever you want to call him. This is Zacchaeus. He's a little good, little guy. He's got little man syndrome or whatever. I don't know. But here's Zacchaeus, and he hears about Jesus, and he's interested in this thing. And he's heard a lot about Jesus. And when Jesus is coming, there's all the multitudes, and there's no way he's going to get a good look at him because he's way down here, and he's walking around trying to see, and he can't see. So he climbs up in a sycamore tree. And he gets up there so he can at least get a glimpse at Jesus Christ. And when Jesus sees that, and Jesus, of course, knew this all along, he comes to him and he points him out. And he says, I'm going to eat dinner at your house. Now, the amazing thing to me about this is uh, the clarification of this thing. You'll notice here that Zacchaeus is a publican. And if you know anything about publicans in the Bible, people didn't like publicans. You say, why? Because it's like over there, you know, that's the tax collectors. You know, you got to go there and pay your taxes, and you got to pay all this stuff. And who likes the tax collectors? That's what the publican was. Now, he said to be a chief publican. And the publicans, what they would do is, they would not only get enough to take care of the taxes, they would solicit enough to kind of make a little interest on the deal. In other words, they would make some money to put in their own pockets. So they were stuffing their pockets rich, even though they were supplying the needs for the, uh, the taxes that were to be paid. So he's a chief publican in contrast with Matthew. Matthew said just to be a publican. Zacchaeus is said to be a chief publican. Then it adds in verse number 2, he was rich. You know, we read about a blind beggar. Somebody that had nothing. And now we read about somebody that has everything. What's the common denominator? They both need the grace of God. Amen. Because I don't care if you're sitting in the middle of squalor and you have nothing, not a cent to your name, or if you're sitting on a mansion on a hilltop and you have all the wealth of this world, you still need the grace of God because not only do poor people go to hell, Rich people go to hell. Matter of fact, riches can be a bad thing. The Bible talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. And of course, I know you, can, you don't have to have it to love it. Amen? You ever see them people that are waiting in line and they go back in line again and again and again? They're scratching these little tickets. And some of them, they don't even have enough money to put gas in their car. They sure love it though. You say, why? Because they're taking what little money they have and trying to get more. That's somebody that loves it. It's called filthy lucre in the Bible. You don't have to have a whole lot to be stingy either. Some of you leaving a quarter as a tip. Look, we're a little bit past 1950. Amen. But this guy was rich and he still needed Jesus. Poor people need Jesus. Middle class people need Jesus. Rich people need Jesus. Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but some are. Well, I just, can't, I just don't like so-and-so because they got money. Yeah, you don't like them because you wish you had it. Maybe they got it because they can handle it and you can't. Oh, me. Now, let's get back to this. Notice his rule and his riches. Somebody said money can buy a bed but not sleep. 
Books but not brains, food but not an appetite, finery but not beauty, a house but not a home, medicine but not health, luxuries but not culture, amusements but not happiness, religion but not salvation. Money can buy a passport to almost everywhere except heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. It's going to take the grace of God. And so when we think about Zacchaeus, we see him here. He's, he's, he has his riches, but he also has his wretchedness. Verse number 7, they nail it right here. They say he's gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Because he was stealing from people. It's pretty bad. Especially stealing from poor people. He's not a Robin Hood. He's not robbing the rich and giving to the poor. He's stealing from everybody. And people know this guy is a sinner. The question is, does Zacchaeus know it? And see, it's hard oftentimes to get people to admit, and we'll talk about that on the last one here, but it's hard oftentimes to get people to admit that they need Jesus Christ. Like I said, preachers don't want to preach on sin. I want to talk about how good God is and how sweet heaven is, but they don't want to point their finger and say, you know what, if you don't get saved, or worse than the coronavirus is a sin virus, and if you die with a sin virus, and you die in unbelief, your unbelief will take you to hell because you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You need the grace of God. You can't earn your way. If you could earn your way to heaven, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. He wouldn't have had to shed His blood on the cross. You are not good enough. You're bad. You're wicked you're evil, you're unclean, you're vile, you're wretched. Right. How dare you talk to me? Preachers used to always talk like that. But now, you know, they're not preachers anymore. They're doctors and they're reverends and they're distinguished. Well, Zacchaeus, he's wretched. The tax collecting system that they have, like I said, they would collect over and above the quota and they would use extortion and so forth, and they would they'd keep money. Jesus is amazing to me in His grace. Aren't you glad, Jesus, even though you might be wretched and vile and unclean and nobody wants to touch you like when you hear the other message, you'll hear some other people that we talk about, and, and people that you might not even want to be around. Like the blind beggar, you might would throw some money at his way. You'd be like, here, you know, like the people standing outside of Walmart, you're like, you know, throw them a dollar bill from a long ways because you don't want to get close to them, you know. And it's like, I don't want to be around these people. And Jesus don't mind being around those people. And all the population, they're like, Zacchaeus is not somebody we want to hang around. Matter of fact, we despise him. Matter of fact, we hate him. He's stealing from us. And Jesus is like, I'm going to go have dinner with him. Because his grace and his kindness and his goodness is, he, he, he is love. God is love. And he can look beyond your fault. He can look beyond your sin. Aren't you glad even though you were a wicked sinner, He still wanted to save you? Even though He knew you weren't going to add anything to His team. I mean, really, you think God is that much better because you've been saved? You think you've added something to heaven? You think that uh, you have gotten on God's side, has made God great? God would still be God and still be great and glorious if you never had gotten saved. But God is so good and merciful and loving that He sees sinners like Zacchaeus. And He sees sinners like blind Bartimaeus that nobody wants to be around. He says, I'll go be around them. Because He even died for them. He died for all men. Amen. The invitation given by Jesus is kind of impolite. Jesus Christ invites Himself over. You ever have friends and neighbors like that? They come over, you know, they hang around and hang around and hang around. And then they're like, what's for dinner? Or they only come around when you're barbecuing, and they can smell the they can smell the barbecue. You know, you know how that stuff goes through the neighborhood, and uh, you're like, "What are you coming around for? What you got on the grill?" <laughs> Jesus invites himself. He's like, "I'm gonna come eat with you today. You rich, you probably gonna have steaks or something. You know, not gonna have pork because you're a son of Abraham, but you'll probably have steaks." <laughs> He's impolite, but he's also imperative. Notice Jesus says, Make haste, come down, for today I must abide. When you get saved, the Lord, He, he moves into your life. And thank God for that. Thank God. 
Thank God it's like a head-on collision. Thank God the Lord just moves in and sometimes He uses circumstances in your life and He, he works things around to kind of nudge Himself in because in our own nature, we don't know what we're doing. We're blind. We're stupid. We, we oftentimes just push the Lord away. Maybe it's a protective thing to where we're trying to protect ourselves or we're shy and, and we're shy of God and we're running from God. Maybe it's a thing because of our sin that we're ashamed of it and we're running from God and we think God could never save somebody like like us and we're running from him and we turn from him and there he is again we turn over here and there he is again he just invites himself into our lives that's the grace of God notice that verses 9 and 10 his impression Zacchaeus something happens to this guy Zacchaeus says look Lord I'm willing to restore back whatever I took from anybody he makes a confession. He's, he admits what he is and what he's done. And he also makes compensation. He does right. Look, you can't make up for all the wrongs you've done. But God saved you by His grace. Do right from here on out. Go ahead and make some decisions. Say, you know, I can't go back and redo the past. I can't relive the past. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, by God's grace, I can do what I'm supposed to do now. That's what Zacchaeus does. Notice that he makes compensation with his finances, with his fellowship, with also uh, his future and his family. Jesus says salvation's come to the house. You know, I think they started having devotion at night. Zacchaeus said, hey, kids, we're going to read the Bible now. Or Zacchaeus said, hey, you know, we're going to start going to... Back then they had synagogue. We're going to go to synagogue on Sabbath day. Some changes took place because he met Jesus. Let's look at one more. Come over to uh, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And we have many, many examples in the Bible. And I wish we had time to go around and do testimonies. And if we could, we could hear different ways the Lord has done things in your life. And we all have different testimonies, yet we all have the same testimony. We were lost without hope and without God. The Lord did some things in our life to show us our need for Christ, and He saved us. So we have the same testimony, but different testimonies. And when we reflect on these testimonies, I know that we can look back, just like I do sometimes, and say, I thank God for those women that went on visitation the year I was born. They went on visitation on a Tuesday or Thursday morning. My mother got saved, and then they went to church that Sunday or Sunday night, and my dad got saved. And then he's the one who led me to Christ. What would have happened if that chain of events would have happened? I don't know. I don't, I don't understand all those things. I can look at it from one perspective, from a human side. So I'm so thankful there was a preacher that kept preaching. I'm so thankful for when I was around 16 years of age. We got back into church. It was a real small church. And a preacher, a southern preacher, got up there and he had an accent. And he got to preach. He preached just like it was 150 people there and just a handful of people there. And he preached and preached and preached. And God began to deal with my heart. I'm glad he kept the doors open. I'm glad he was faithful. You start looking at these little things and you see the people and you can see the blessing that people have been in your life. But the backdrop of all of that is G-R-A-C-E. The grace of God. And so we have to see these pictures as demonstrations of God's amazing grace. And I hope you see that, especially with Paul. Here in Acts chapter number 9, you know the story. When you back up to chapter number 7 and 8, Stephen is being killed. He's the first martyr. And the Bible tells us Paul was consenting to his death, Acts 8 verse 1. In other words, Paul was in charge of the whole deal. And as a Pharisee, what Paul did is he found Christians and he would turn them over to the authorities. And the Romans gave the Jews authority to enact uh, punishment toward heretics. And they had the ability to have what, they, what we would call today maybe a hate crime. In other words, they commit a hate crime against the uh, Jewish establishment of that day, so they persecuted them and killed them. And Paul was responsible for this stuff. Now what about Paul? Acts chapter number 9, you know the story. Well, for brevity, come down to verse number 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. 
It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Here we have Paul's conversion. I call him the proud Pharisee. He tells us a lot of details. Now Paul gets saved. His name is Saul here. And later on his name changes to Paul. He writes three quarters of your Bible. After you get through Acts, you have Romans, 1 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You go all the way through to Hebrews. That's all, Paul. Three quarters of the New Testament is written by this guy. And he was a Pharisee that hated Christ and hated Christians. And God saved him. You talk about amazing grace. Not only can God save some beggar on the side of the road that knows that Jesus is the son of David, he can take... A Pharisee that doesn't believe Jesus is the son of David. And he can convince him as well. I like how God, and that shows you the truth of the Bible. It shows you the truth of God. That God can save whosoever will. It's not just this little group or that little group. One thing that is common though, you have to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You have to be a believer. Well, what happens with Paul? He tells us a little bit about this. He says, He profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. He says over in Philippians chapter 3, when he talks about his testimony, he says, Though others have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh he hath whereof he may have confidence in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we'll close with this. Flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Notice what he says. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. If you know anything about Pharisees in the Bible, they were real proud people. I mean, they had all their religion down in a row. They were very systematic. And they were, Jesus got onto them because they were hypocrites. They had the letter of the law, but they didn't have the spirit of the law. Here's Jesus Christ healing people on the Sabbath day. And they're like, oh no, you did this on the Sabbath day. Jesus is like, who cares what it is? I just healed this guy. Can't you, you can't see the forest for looking at the trees? It's like, preacher, I cannot believe we had a 9.30 service and an 11 o'clock service. That is not in the Bible. Well, I haven't found commodes in the Bible either. <laughs> you know, the Pharisees were so full of pride. And you think about Paul persecuting Christians. He was so zealous. He was so convinced that what he was doing was right. That he's willing to take another life for it. Well, that's pretty bad. That's pretty proudful. And by the way, Bible-believing Christians do not kill other people because they don't believe what we believe. When you study the New Testament and when you study church history, you may find Roman Catholicism that participates in crusades. And you may find Muslims and things like that, and extreme, even extreme Hindus. There are extreme Hindu groups in India that take Christians and persecute them and try to get them to recant. They'll put a video camera in front of them, beat them senseless to try to get them to denounce Christ. Right now, taking place today, Hindus. You'll find also Muslims doing those kind of things. Bible-believing Christians, we preach the truth. And if you don't want to believe the truth, that's up to you. Not being mean, but if you want to go to hell, help yourself. We put the truth out there. Paul, as a Pharisee, thought he was so right that he had to persecute what was wrong. And in his pride and in his arrogance, he went on that train. And of course, as he went on that train, he had a head-on collision with the Lord. The Lord says, you persecute me. And Paul immediately believes. He says in Corinthians, I was one born out of due time. He believes right when Jesus Christ knocks him down and that bright light shines. He blinds him for three days. You talk about an experience. Well, notice here in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Look at this. Of whom I am chief. 
Boy, he's not proud anymore, is he? He's persuaded now. He knows what he is. Can you imagine Paul having people killed like that and then being a preacher and preaching to some of the families of the people that you had killed? He had to have grace to be able to do that. And of course, God gave the Christians, you read in Acts 9 and 10, they were real gun shy. Ananias, you know, in Acts 9, he's like, Lord, you want me to talk to this guy? This is the guy that's killing people. Uh, Lord's like, he's saved now. He's all right. And then Barnabas puts his arm around him and takes him around and says, look, this guy's a convert. I heard him preach. He's risked his life for Christ. He's the real deal because everybody was gun shy of this fella. They're thinking he's coming in here to spy on us. You know, he's going to get all our names and turn us in. That kind of a deal. But Paul was convinced he saw himself as the sinner he was. And he later on describes this in Romans. The law showed him that he couldn't keep the law. In other words, of the sense of righteousness of God, not the righteousness of the law. But he understood that he was a sinner and he needed a Savior. Notice what else he says in this passage. Of whom I am chief, verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. He's given to be a pattern for us. Now when you study Paul's life, what you see is God's amazing grace in saving him, but then you see God's amazing grace sustaining him. Now, you begin to think about that through Paul's life. He persecuted Christians. What happened to him? He came back. He got persecuted. He got thrown in jail. At least on two occasions. The last occasion is when he gave his life. He was martyred. He was killed. And he said, I'm a pattern of suffering. And we know that in 2 Corinthians, whenever he had that thorn in the flesh, and God didn't take that thorn in the flesh away from him. He had this, some type of disease, probably affected by his eyes when he got blinded and so forth. But he had the thorn in the flesh, and he asked God three times to take it away. God said, I'm not going to take it away. But he said this, my grace is sufficient. So here you are, you're saved by God's grace, you're kept by God's grace. You are sustained by God's grace. No matter what you go through in life, God's grace will carry you. I don't care what it is. And sometimes you look at other people, you think, man, how are they making it? How are they waking up? How are they going to sleep? How are they going through the tragedy they're going through? And then sometimes you wonder, and then you go through something in your own life, and you ask for God's help. And you know what the Lord does? He comes along right beside you, and He helps you. You don't know that you're going to be able to get through it until you get through it. You say, what is it? It's God's amazing grace. If you go up to... Uh, of course, our courthouse here doesn't have too many steps, but you go to somewhere like U.S. Capitol in Washington, you look at those steps going up that thing, that's a pretty good, pretty good haul. Take some little two or three year old, can you imagine them looking, okay, yeah, they got some energy, but not that much. The best way for them to get to the top is for their daddy to pick them up and put them on the shoulders and carry them to the top. You go through life, you know what, you'll come to some places and there's all kind of steps, there's all kind of Places you don't know how you're going to cross over. And the way you're going to cross over is by the grace of God. He saved you by grace. He's going to get you through this thing by grace. He's already promised us where we're going. We know where we came from. God made us. We know where we're headed. That's heaven. So what are we supposed to do in the meantime? We're supposed to live by grace. We've been saved by faith. By grace through faith. And we're to live by grace through faith. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for a word of prayer to be dismissed. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Hope you got a blessing from the message. So good to see you.